You know, Anton, thank you for playing that song for us. Uh, we, we jokingly said that, uh, we, we, we often say that what, what instrument can't Anton play? And so we were teasing that maybe we should call this new band the Six Antons. And uh, I, I, we're very grateful for his many, many gifts and for all the gifts of the people who make these services possible. I know that I'm very grateful. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Jesus, you do make all things new. And we're asking you to renew our minds now as we come to your word. Speak to us because we need to hear what you have to say. We pray in your name. Amen. I remember years ago, I talked with Pastor Brian about a game he used to play with his boys when they would be watching TV, and a commercial would come on, and he'd ask them the question, where's the truth and where's the lie in that commercial? Try to deconstruct the false promises or the half-truths in uh, commercials. It's a great idea. I think I did it with my kids at times. Uh, and if you do that even still, it's fascinating to think about. If you really pay attention and try to listen for what's the false promise here? Where's the truth and where's the lie? I think perhaps one of the places that this is most uh, striking is in the whole reality TV genre. When that began to come out, uh, when that began to become a thing. Uh, you, how many times did you hear this in promotion? The most shocking episode ever of Survivor next week, you know? Or the episode everyone will be talking about. They're using FOMO, fear of missing out to stir our hearts to go, we, we have to see this, we don't want to miss out. In fact, the irony there is crazy if you think about it. The, they're convincing you that the way not to miss out on your life is to sit in front of a TV watching someone else's life. And we can go right down the list. But learning to discern false promises and half-truths in our culture based on the truth of the Word of God is a critical skill for those of us who follow Jesus. It's no time more needed than right now, especially in social media these days. People are being misled, led astray all the time. And we have to develop those skills of discernment. And that's what this series really is about. Did God say that? It's taking some of these slogans or sayings that we hear in our culture, which on face value sound spiritual. They sound good. They sound even Christian. And digging deeper, using the word of God as a lens to say, what's behind that? Is there a lie there I should let go of? Is there a truth to hold on to? How should we understand that? So we've looked at things like everything happens for a reason. We started the series with that, God's sovereignty in the big picture. And then Pastor Brian talked to us about this statement that people are basically good. I believe people are basically good in the world. Is, is that in the Bible? What does the Bible say about that? And last week, Pastor Sterling did a fantastic job of unpacking the statement, which we often hear, God won't give you more than you can handle. If you missed that, go back and watch any of these, uh, particularly Sterling. He did a fantastic job on that question, and it really leads into this question. The goal of our series is not to answer every possible question or deconstruct every slogan out there, but to help you, to help us become better equipped to do our own spiritual discernment practice. You know, in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul shows up and he preaches the gospel to uh, Jewish believers in Berea. And we're told the Berean Christians, the Berean believers, were of more noble character for one reason— because every day when Paul would preach to them the gospel, they would go home and check the scriptures to see if what he said was true. That, what we're doing is trying to be like that as we think about and engage with our culture. Okay, so what about this phrase, just let go and let God? Did God say that? Is that in the Bible? How do we understand that as Christians? Have you ever used that phrase? Have you ever heard it? And if you have, in what context? Almost always it's with somebody who's anxious, stressed, struggling in some way. It's offered, well, if you would just let go, then God would step in and take care of things. You'd experience God's power if you'd just let go. Trust God. He's in control. You're not. And so let him take over. I talked to a woman who was new to our church before COVID hit. She was brand new. She'd moved into this area. And she said after a few months of being here, that her husband lost his job. She began working part-time to make ends meet, and he was looking for work. They had three children under the age of seven, and she found out her sister, who she just moved away from, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She was devastated and crushed and weighed down. And she told me that in a phone conversation with a friend from her previous church, that friend said to her, well, you just need to let go 
and let God. And she said, Pastor Jeff, I don't know what to let go of. My life already feels out of control. What am I supposed to let go of? I don't feel like I'm holding on to anything right now. So should you just let go and let God? What does the Bible really say about this? Well, let's just walk through a couple of texts from the Old Testament and the New. Psalm 4610, one of my favorite psalms, the psalmist says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That phrase in Hebrew, be still, literally means cease striving. It sounds a lot like let go. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Everyone knows this verse. It's very common. Uh, some of you know it by heart or have be familiar to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Sounds like let go. Don't trust in your understanding. Let God trust in him. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, the Apostle Paul writing here says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Take your requests and your anxieties, present them to God in prayer, and then God, then you're letting go, and God then will give you his peace. Or 1 Peter 5, 7, this simple but profound statement, cast all your cares on him, your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. These all sound a lot like let go and let God. But these are just a few of the places, the many places in the Bible that talk about things we need to let go of. So clearly, there are things that we need to let go of. Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 says, do not be anxious or worried about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. You can't even add a single hour to your life by worrying, and your Heavenly Father knows what you need. So clearly, clearly, there are things we need to let go of, but not so fast. That's not all the Bible has to say on the subject. Let's just look at a few other texts that speak to a different perspective. Again, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul writing here says, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Pressing on, taking hold, that doesn't sound like letting go, does it? Or 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Again, fighting a fight, taking hold. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul compares our spiritual life to that of a runner in a race. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run then so that you may obtain it. Run to win. Run in a way to get the prize. That doesn't sound like just letting go. Colossians 1.29, one one more. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that powerfully works within me. Now, again, these are just a few of the places, the many places in the Bible, that talk about the opposite of letting go and letting God. Now, on their own, each half of this phrase are good and true. Let go. There are undeniably things that if you're going to follow Jesus, you must let go of. You must let go of past shame. You must let go of past wounds. You must let go of unforgiveness in your heart. You must let go of the things which hold you back from trusting him and following him. No question. There are also things that we must let God do that only God can do. That when we, we get into trouble when we try to do God's job. We're not qualified for it. So on their face, each half of this phrase makes sense. But when you put them together in a single phrase, I think something different is implied. Just let go and let God together implies something else. We need to be asking ourselves the two questions Pastor Brian told his boys about the commercials. What's the truth I need to hold on to? And what's the lie I need to let go of? By the way, that's an important discipline for us in so many aspects of our lives. It's tempting, I think, to play the all or nothing game of our culture. You see this all the time. Well, if I accept this one truth claim of this one ideological group, then by definition I have to swallow all of what they're selling. Or, or if I reject this one piece, then I reject all of it. That's not so. It's, friends, we have to be aware that people who look different and think different and live different than us 
who we might disagree with on a hundred things, could still speak truth into our lives in one area or many areas. And the other side of the coin is also true. People that look like us and think like us and act like us, who we agree with ideologically in a hundred areas, could still be wrong in an area. So we should be, let's get back on the subject. (laughs) Back to the question. What's right and true about letting go and letting God? What's right about let go and let God? I want to briefly describe three ways this idea is actually very helpful for us in our Christian life. Three uh, things that, that we should, we, the ways we can apply it in a helpful and right way. First, it encourages us to surrender our will to God's will. This is so crucial. We were singing about it a moment ago. I surrender all, right? That's so hard to do. It's not a one-time thing. It's a moment-by-moment daily thing because my will gets in the way of what God wants to do. And so letting go, if we're talking about surrendering my will, my desire to have my way, then yes, let God have his way. In fact, recently my family and I watched a show on Netflix, a documentary called The American Gospel. I'd encourage you to watch it. It'll challenge you in some ways. Uh, it, It unpacks this subtle message in American Christianity that the gospel is really about you, your agenda, your desires, and your life to fulfill you. That is profoundly unbiblical. We need to let go of that and surrender our will to God's will. Jesus himself demonstrates this in Luke 22. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying the night before his crucifixion. And he says the very thing we're talking about. Lord, if you're willing, you could take this away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. If Jesus had to surrender his human will to the will of the Father, so do we. So must we. Second way this phrase is helpful is that it calls us to repent of anxious worry and to trust in God. There's a bit of a control freak in every one of us, some of you more than others. There's also a bit of a a fearful, um, anxious person in every one of us, some of you more than others. Frederick Buechner uh, wrote famously in his book, The Alphabet of Grace, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but fear. Think about that. The opposite of faith is not doubt. Doubt involves questions and wondering about God. God doesn't want to leave us with our doubts unaddressed, but they're not the opposite of faith. In fact, they're often the avenue to deeper faith. The opposite of faith is fear and anxiety and worry about what's going to happen. You are not qualified. Those of you who are control freaks, you're not qualified to control your own life. You're not qualified to control. You can't do it, let alone somebody else's or the whole world. That's God's job. And those of you that are prone to anxiety and fear, there is a sovereign God who is in control. Third, it reminds us that we cannot do anything to earn God's love. Friends, this is probably the most important thing, uh, that, the way this phrase can be helpful to you. The most important truth to hold on to. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, let go of your need to prove yourself. Let go of your striving to earn favor. Let go of your desire to measure up. Let go of the treadmill you're on to be loved by others and ultimately by God. The gospel says you can do nothing. You are powerless to earn God's love. You can only receive it by grace. And if you're clinging to the desire to earn it, to measure up, to achieve it, to accomplish it, to grab it, then you can't receive. So we do need to let go of our our desire and our effort to earn God's love and receive by grace what he offers. The classic place, which we quote all the time around here, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God, and it's not something you've done. It's not from you. It's God's gift. Let go of that. So many of us grow up sort of absorbing from the church background or lack thereof that we grew up in or in our culture that somehow we're not very good, we're not good enough, and God's angry with us, and if we would just get our act together, he might love us. Well, the first half of that's true. We're not very good. The second half of that is totally false. It's not if you get your act together. If you humbly come and receive what he's offering you in love at the cross. Martin Lloyd-Jones asked this question of young men that were in his church, and young women too, uh, and he would say, are you a Christian? Very simple question. And if they answered with anything like, well, I'm trying to be, well, I hope I I am, well, I'm working at it, well, I, I want to become one, 
he knew they had a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. You don't try to be. You don't work at it. To be, you, you enter in. And then once you enter in, God invites you into a life where he begins to work with you. Again, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your doing. It's a gift. Okay, this all sounds like let go and let God is really good. We should just stick with the good parts. What's wrong now? What's wrong about the phrase, let go and let God? And it may surprise you, but I think there are some things that are really misleading if we're not careful, that I see in people's faith, and my own as well, that we need to name, identify, and unpack a bit. And so to keep it even, let me give you three things, three ways this idea can mislead us as Christ followers. First, it makes a false promise of a kind of super spirituality. Let me, let me explain that. I think subtly implied in this phrase is, if you would just learn to let go, whatever that is, then you would experience God's power in amazing ways. The secret that you're missing to the higher spiritual life is learning to let go. So you just got to learn to let go. Ironically, this can end up producing way more anxiety than peace in our hearts. Think about it. Just learn to let go. Well, how do I do that? Well, you let go. Well, let go of what? Well, you, you just let go. Yeah, but what do I let go of? How do I let go? Well, stop trying to control things. Well, I feel I'm out of control. Well, just let go. It, it's, it's a circular argument, you see. I've seen people that are they're, they're struggling and striving for some deeper spirituality they feel like they're missing out on. J.I. Packer, a famous theologian, wrote in, in a book called Keeping in Step with the Spirit, he said, his early Christian life, he struggled with this idea that there was a higher plane, like a Christianity 2.0, that he hadn't achieved yet. And he writes this, he says, I scraped inside my soul to ensure that my surrender was complete and labored to let go and let God. All I knew was the expected and longed for experience never came. Friends, there's no secret super Christian level. There's no next level Christianity. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all in this together if we're all in this in the same place. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church or with no church. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic, racial, ethnic background. It's level when we come to Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't have issues, but there's no like secret level that you can achieve if you learn to let go. Every person who trusts in Christ is 100% totally, inextricably united to him for eternity. You don't always believe that, you don't always live like that, but it's true. Okay, second. The second problem is that it presumes we must let God do something. Think about it for a minute. Just let go and then God would jump in. Just let go and let God. As if God is in heaven going, I would love to get involved, but they won't let me have a turn. They just won't let me. I mean, I would, can I try? Let me try. Let me try to fix your life. Would you let me? Oh, they won't let me. It's ridiculous. We don't, technically speaking, let God do anything. He's the sovereign king of all creation. He doesn't need our permission to do his will. We're, he's not our servants. We're his servants. And so the presumption subtly in there is that, if, you know, that you've got to get out of God's way because he's, he's waiting for you to get out of his way. That's not so. God does what God pleases. Third, and, and most important, it promotes a weak and a passive faith. George MacDonald, in his book, The Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, which is a sort of a spiritual autobiography of his life as a Scottish pastor, he says, souls that cultivate passivity do not thrive but waste away. Souls that cultivate passivity do not thrive but waste away. If you're sitting around waiting for God to change you, waiting for God to show up and do something, that is not spiritual, spiritually thriving. It's wasting away, he's saying. Everywhere you look in the pages of Scripture, you see women and men who are striving, struggling, laboring into faithful obedience to the kingdom of God. Why? Because they've been transformed by the free gift of grace. It's changed them, and so they're on a mission. They're working out their own sin and issues. They're working for justice in the world. They're doing work, internal and external work. Why? Because they've received something that's made them different. The gospel is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. There's a big difference. 
The grace of God forgives our sin and enables our obedience. The grace of God secures our future in eternity and strengthens our faith in the right now. This means we should be actively engaged in what God is doing in us and in the world. You have work to do. Going back to J.I. Packer, he said perhaps a better phrase is not let go and let God, but trust God and get going. I like that phrase. Trust God who's in control and at work and get going. One of the New Testament passages that I just want to spend a little bit of time as we wrap up here that's most, the most profoundly illustrates this is in Paul's letter to the Philippian church, the second chapter. Let me read to you chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. He's talking about Christ's example of humility and urging them and us to follow that example. And he describes what Jesus has done. Verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of a man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Paul's powerful and profound description of what Jesus has done. He's done that. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He became obedient. He went to the cross. He purchased your redemption. He's forgiven your sins. He rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. He now intercedes for us on our behalf at the right hand of the Father. He's done all that. Okay, what Paul says next is so crucial for us to hear and for us to understand. Let me read to you verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Did you hear that? Therefore, because of what Jesus Christ has done, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because God is working in you. This statement about working out your salvation, which we're going to talk about, is bookended by what Christ has done and what God is doing. They're on both ends. Jesus has done this. He's accomplished your salvation. So now work it out. And by the way, God is doing it. He's working in you. The phrase in Greek for, uh, working, is, for working out is the word uh, katergozomai. It's a compound word, and it literally means bring to completion, uh, bring all the way in. And what it means, you might say, is live it out. Let your salvation. We think of salvation as like this get out of hell free card that Jesus gives us, which we put in our pocket and we just go about our lives. It has no bearing on the rest of our lives. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is I'm forgiven by grace. Now I step into a whole new life and I have to work it out and do all of who I am, how I think, how I see the world, how I interact with my coworkers and my neighbors and my family, how I speak. I work it out into all of me. And that's a lifelong process. And by the way, I can't do it, and neither can you. I am 100% incapable of working out my own salvation on my own. I can't be the father my kids need, the husband my wife needs and deserves, the pastor this church needs. I cannot do that on my own. But here's the good news. Christ has done it, and God is doing it. So now, trust God and get to work. I think that's better than let go and let God. I think it's trust God and step into the life he's called you to. Get to work on what he wants to do in you. Notice he says fear and trembling because this is a holy thing he's invited us into. This is a big deal. God works in you, friends. He is working in you. And when you join him, you're partnering with the, the God of the universe to do a good work in you. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. And then verse 10 is, to do good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. Even the good works that we do, the things we do, are because God wills them in us. So why would we resist him? Let's join him. Friends, let's make the commitment that we're gonna trust God and get going. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we know there are things we have to let go of and leave behind. And we know there are things that only you can do. And we praise you that you have done them and are doing them by the power of your gospel. Forgive us for taking control and for freezing up in fear. Help us to trust you and to step into the full life you've invited us to. And that's not an easy life, God. That's not a life that's going to be smooth sailing. There's hard work to do in our own souls, in our hearts, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in this world. But you've called us to it. And you have already accomplished it at the cross, and you're working right now. We have nothing to fear. You will not let us fail. You are with us, and you are so good, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.